welcome to On The Curbs, I'm your host Timo Albers Daly. Joining me this week is American Flat Trek CEO Michael Locke. Locke previously served as COO of Automobili Lamborghini Americas where he was responsible for developing the business and image of the famous Italian brand. Before joining Lamborghini he spent nearly a decade at Ducati including a key eight year period as CEO of Ducati North America. Locke also held the position of CEO at Triumph Motorcycles USA, where he established the US subsidiary of British Marquis back in 1994. Michael has been at the helm of American Flat Track for over six years now and has completely revived the series, putting it back on the map and attracting the attention of mainstream sponsors like Progressive Insurance, Mission Foods, Ram Trucks and many others. We caught up recently to chat about all this and more, including why people should give AFT a chance, what the biggest challenge to growing the sport was, plans for the future, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Michael. Thank you for being here today. First of all, how are you? Very well, thank you. Actually enjoying a rare cool day in Florida in August. It's one for the calendar. I'm going to say, I've been to Florida a couple, couple of times and uh, yeah, it's, it's a cool day. It's very rare indeed. <laughs> oh, look, between June and September, it's um, uh, it's pretty much a one-way street here. So, um, uh, uh, so like I say, a rare cool day. Aggressive with both hands while you can, I think. <laughs> So, first question I always like to ask everyone who comes on here, what got you into motorsport to begin with? Oh, um, well, I mean, as a kid, as a teenager, um, uh, back in England, I was into bikes, um, as uh, just about all my friends at school were. Um, And being interested in bikes led to getting bikes, which led to, um, in my case, uh, being able to start a career working with motorcycles. When I left college, I went to go and work for Honda UK in London. Um, And from there, um, was fortunate enough to work with Triumph and Ducati and Lamborghini and and now ending up here at AMA Pro Racing is that, you know, with those kinds of companies, you find yourself being dragged into motorsports uh, one way or another because they're intrinsic. You know, motorsports are intrinsic to those brands and to uh, expressing the kind of uh, um, credentials uh, for the brand that uh, that, uh, that uh, are very attractive. So I've been involved in two and four wheel uh, motorsports uh, on and off pretty much all my career. So you mentioned that working for like Triumph Ducati in the beginning, was that always roughly the plan for you or how did that all come about? <laughs> no, I, I, I ran away to the circus, um, uh, certainly as far, as far as my family were concerned. <laughs> um, my, my family are, are, are all quite uh, academic and intellectual and very public service. So you can imagine I was uh, completely the black sheep of the family by getting involved in noisy engines and... Um, Seems to have worked out all right. It, it wor- it's worked out fine for me. And I, although I think m- my, my mother's still somewhat bewildered about what I actually do for a living. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no real heritage of it in my family. But, mm. uh, uh, but I, w- when I was a, a kid leaving college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just wanted to do something that felt real with real products and, and innovation and people and, uh, and, and so on. And, and, you know, cars and bikes are certainly uh, all of that. So then you are now in American flat track racing. Tell us a bit about that for those who don't know what that is. Mm. Um, and, and actually, a lot of people don't know what that is, um, certainly outside of the US. So American flat track is uh, professional flat track racing. Flat track racing means um, racing on a dirt uh, all kinds of different dirt, all the way from crushed limestone through clay, through pea gravel, a variety of different surfaces, but predominantly on dirt ovals. Um, uh, so where you are only turning left, um, uh, of course, and there are no front brakes um, because front brakes on two wheels on dirt, very bad idea. Um, <laughs> uh, so... Won't get much racing done that way. 
Not, not for very long, no. Uh, so it's fast, and, and, and while it might sound like it's somewhat monotonous or predictable that it's just an oval of 30 times or 40 times, in fact, these are races of great strategy um, and, uh, and, 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 if you like, two-wheel chess playing. Um, the entry into a corner could be fast, um, but then exit will be slow. Um, or entry could be measured and directed and slow and exit could be fast. And there are these duels that go on uh, all the way through the races. Um, and um, I'm often asked, wow, how fast do they go? And, and, and we get disappointed looks from people when we say, they probably peak at a, somewhere between 130 and 140 miles an hour, which doesn't sound very fast. Still and, not bad and, though, is it? Until you're there. Um, because they are, it's one of the few forms of, of motorsport where you are actively trying to lose traction. Um, you will not get through those corners fast if you don't lose traction. It's a question of how much and when and how much you're in control. Um, so, so for people who are normally used to say something like Formula One or normal track racing, you think, Traction's everything, it just completely flips it on its head on that one, trying to get your head around. Abs it. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, if I were to say to you that the, the riders will come to the end of the start finish straight, so they'll be in maximum speed in top gear, um, and they will be looking through that corner and they will be working out when to come off the gas. Uh, and, and these bikes have enormous flywheel effect. So when you come off the, the throttle, you slow down already. They will be doing that and then trying to pitch the rear of the motorcycle sideways, break traction with the rear in order to be able to power, power through the corner at some point when they feel it's safe to come back on the gas. And they will not only be doing that at high speed, they will likely be doing it three or four wide going into that corner, separated sometimes by as little as a, a centimetre or two. In fact, sometimes not separated at all. So not a lot of room for error there. Very little room for error. If somebody sneezed in the middle of the corner, there would be implications. Be fair, I think if you sneezed any part around the track, there'd be implications. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed, indeed, indeed. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a very American form. Mm -hmm. motorcycle racing um uh, flat track racing is done i've seen it done in europe in, in the uk and in spain and they do it in australia and we have fans all over the world but it's really a uniquely american uh, invention and in pro motorcycle racing that makes it somewhat unique because all the other disciplines like road racing and, and supercross and motocross are very international but but AFT, American Flat Track, really is a very American invention and, uh, and it's the original form of pro uh, racing over here. And so yeah, it brings me nicely to the next question. Though, I mean, it's been around since, I think, 1954, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but it seems to have fallen out of favour a little bit in America in the past decade or so, at least. So, I mean, what sets it apart from everything else and why should people who've never watched it yeah. take interest in it now? I, it's a good question, and it certainly did have, um, uh, I would say, maybe two decades in the shadows. Um, to understand that, you have to understand some of the kind of evolution of motorcycle racing. So um, uh, flat track was the biggest and most widely popular form of motorcycle sport over here until about the mid-late 1970s, when road racing started to rise as a global sport. Um, that Grand Prix, Grand Prix motorcycle racing had been run for decades, but it wasn't until the mid 70s that the Americans really started getting involved and personalities like Kenny Roberts and, and Wayne Rainey and Freddie Spencer, you know, there was a whole uh, uh, two decade domination of Grand Prix by Americans and, 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 and the curiosity, curiosity is they were all flat trackers, they were all originally flat trackers and they had mm -hmm. learned their craft um, riding on dirt and on uh, asphalt. And they had learned from flat track this backing it in technique of, of really swinging a motorcycle and deliberately losing traction and then powering through a corner. Well, European road racing motorcyclists never learned that. Um, no. they, they, they hadn't dirt tracked as kids. I remember being, you know, riding a motorcycle in England when I was a kid, you wouldn't, 
breaking traction really was not was not what you wanted to do. So the Americans came to Grand Prix with this technique and dominated for a couple of decades. So, so that was good for America in, in international motorcycle sport, but it removed from our sport all the top stars um, because you could earn lots more money and travel the world and, uh, and, and all the things that go al along with that by going road racing. So flat tracks started to lose um, talent and uh, and manufacturers and sponsors and and that's a downward spiral then the second whammy came which was the rise of supercross um so supercross evolved out of motocross and it's effectively stadium motocross it's it's glamorous big lights big crowd uh, uh spectacular jumps and so on and supercross became very very popular through the late late in, uh, 1980s 90s and 2000s and that stole another whole generation of stars from uh, American flat track because uh, again similar skill set crossover skill set between the two sports and lots of money um, uh, went into that sport so 1990s and early 2000s flat track really had receded into becoming a bit of a pro-am sport and um, uh, and lost mass appeal until quite recently, until the last five or six years, when we have uh, taken over the management of the sport um, within our company and, and have really modernized and uh, simplified rules and, and have reached out to manufacturers and sponsors. And we now, you know, you fast forward all the way to 2021, we have more manufacturers uh, competing directly or indirectly in our sport than any other motorcycle sport in North America. Um, uh, and, and, and the weakness that we had in the 70s and 80s has actually turned into a strength now because we are, we are the uh, bridge between the extremes of road racing and, and supercross. We sit right in the middle. We have a, 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 a foot in both camps. And that was the message that we took to brands like Honda and Harley and Indian and KTM and, and so on and said, look, this sport is uniquely American. It is raced across the heartland um, uh, with very loyal fans, you can put your brand front and center for relatively low cost uh, compared to uh, some other sports. And we can give you a huge bang for the buck in terms of TV coverage and, and so on and so forth. So that's a strategy we followed uh, in the last few years. And we've had um, some really, posit really positive results from it. I was going to say, so I was thinking particularly with the last year with COVID and everything, um, there were a lot of challenges as a result of that. And how are you managing to develop the this AF team to and back into a mainstream sport to being sponsored by these global brands? Because again, I think maybe part of that would be that whilst the, it helps that it's, there's the heritage and all there and everything, but obviously with this decline, you've kind of got this underdog but soft reboot kind of story. Yes. That, would that certainly help on the selling point? No, that, that, that that's a good point. Uh, and I tell you, through the last 18 months and, and uh, the pandemic and, and so on, we've learned a lot of things we thought we'd never have to learn um, about how to run public events, about um, uh, 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 liaison with politicians and public health officials. There were, I have skills now that, um, that I never imagined I would have to develop. Um, and ultimately, you, if you run outdoor um, events with grandstands and fans and 500 people in the paddock in the midst of a pandemic, you can do one of three things. You can either carry on regardless, completely blind to the outside world. Not that I would recommend that. You can, <laughs> you can sit down on the couch on the sidelines and wait for it all to go away. I would not advise that either. Or you can operate some kind of hopefully smart hybrid model where you find a way, you find a way to get your job done. You find a way to deliver um, uh, value to your uh, sponsors and you keep your race teams and your, and your athletes in a job. And the way we've done that in, in, in a country this size um, and, and a country this size has both a, a challenge and an opportunity. The opportunity is if you can't race here, go somewhere else. Um, yeah. and, and there has not been uh, a, a totally uniform approach to dealing with a public pandemic in the US. So some, some areas of the country, for whatever reason, have been much more sensitive and much more restrictive in running 
um, uh, sporting events, and others have had a, 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 a different route. So we we re-engineered our schedule in 2020 and, and now into 2021 to be able to plan to go to venues where we thought we had a good likelihood that it would actually happen. Um, and we've had a couple of surprises on that, but generally speaking, that has worked for us. And we found that um, maximizing um, the reach of the sport and the power of the sport through uh, televising and streaming um, has compensated in some respects for not being able to run normal uh, live in-person events. And we changed our business model um, to target revenue from partnerships that are leveraging um, uh, audience growth uh, through broadcast rather than counting bums on seats uh, necessarily in the grandstands. Although, having said that, the last few months, we've had a lot of bounce back of people who had been locked down and restricted for a year or so who were screaming for any opportunity to get out of the house and 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 and, and participate in normal life again so in some of our recent events we've had real bumper crowds uh but bigger than we would have expected just because people were desperate for something to do and we uh, have reassured people by um adopting nascar's um, uh, emergency safety protocols for uh, COVID, something we couldn't uh, so easily invented all by ourselves. But we are fortunate that we are cousins with uh, with the good folks at NASCAR, who have a lot of resource and uh, and are very proactive. So we lifted a lot of their protocols about track and trace and uh, and smart hard cards and, uh, uh, and and so on and so forth in order to be able to satisfy. Um, uh, you know, public authorities that we were responsible and not just wanting to come to town and become a super spreader event. So it's been it's been very interesting, but we have survived through this. And I think we're in reasonably good shape. Yeah, I mean, one of the silver linings you could probably take it take from the last 18 months is that with everyone kind of stuck inside everywhere, it's kind of they're looking for something new that they might not have come across or might not have had the time to even investigate before so they see something. And if you say, as you say, if they're from uh, somewhere in, in Spain or somewhere else where they do this racing and they're kind of aware of it in America, but they're not aware of it that it's coming back, then we're uh, able to, to, to get involved. For, for sure, there's that. For sure, there's that. And I tell you another uh, variable that we couldn't have anticipated was that, um, you know, during this whole uh, kind of scary period for people, unprecedented scary period, people have sought ways of preserving their sanity by, by being able to be able to live uh, uh, safely, but m maybe doing something they haven't done before or haven't done for a long time. And over here in the US, and I believe in Europe as well, there's been an enormous resurgence in the sale of motorcycles. Um, because, you know, motorcycles, which are traditionally seen as a somewhat of an antisocial activity that if you turn it on its head in a pandemic a motorcycle is a is, is quite a safe and responsible Ideal. <laughs> to get out of the house because uh, because you're riding you know solo or if you're riding with friends you've got helmets on and you your distance <laughs> and so on so motorcycles have seen a real resurgence and uh, and, and a resurgence, I, I suspect, from a lot of people who had ridden them before but had lapsed for whatever reason. Well, those are, no doubt, those are our fans. If we just reach out and touch them and remind them about flat track racing and maybe they hadn't looted it for 10 or 20 years, they would be very surprised about how much we've modernised it and, and made the show slick and professional and fast and exciting and we take use of a lot of, uh, we, we take advantage of a lot of technologies um, that can bring the racing uh, much closer to you and make it more personal or challenge your perceptions of it. So we have a partnership with a, 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 a very interesting technology company called uh, Insta360, who make uh, miniature um, cameras, uh, very miniature cameras. Um, if you think about something the size of a, a square of um, chalk for playing pool, right? Yeah. Think about those tiny little chalk squares. Well, Insta 360's cameras are barely bigger than that. And some of them uh, enable us to shoot 360 degree uh, content. So 
so that the camera can be sitting on the handlebars of the bike. I'm, saying, I'm already thinking you stick them on a couple of places on the bike and you've got some great shots there immediately. And it, and it puts the viewer right in the heart of the action in a way that they could never have imagined. You physically before. can't get any closer. <laughs> you literally can't get any closer. And, and so we've, we've been playing with um, that technology and with our technology partner, Insta360, to, to be able to innovate the viewing experience and make it more dynamic and, and more unpredictable. And, and so I think a lot of the fans who've stumbled across AFT Look at that and say, "Oh my God, what are those guys doing?" And and of course, you know, that, that that that's that's a real hook. So, so we have we've learned um, we've learned a lot in the last eighteen months about how you have to innovate a business like ours to um, uh, to keep growing. Never a dull moment. <laughs> um, no dull moments. No. <laughs> so you yourself, you've got over 30 years of corporate leadership and business experience, COVID aside, what's been the biggest lesson that you've learned to succeed in your industry during this time? Um, you know, when, when I was a kid out of college, uh, I worked for Honda. And, and, you know, Honda is an engineering-led company, always has been, and very po-faced and, and very serious and, and make good, good products. But, but towards the end of my time there, they were starting to explore... Um, how their role as an, uh, as an automotive brand was evolving in the world as the world was getting smaller and, and they were getting bigger. And they came up with a, 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 a catchphrase. And I, I remember it, and it was, um, think global, act local. Mm. And Honda coined that back in, God, 1990s. Um, and, and, and the more I've worked uh, in different companies and, and, and in different locations, the more I realized that, that is the uh, key to sustaining growth. So, um, and I've learned it sometimes the hard way. <laughs> that you know, I've worked for two really extraordinary Italian brands, um, Ducati, Ducati and Lamborghini, um, who are separated by about fifteen kilometers in. Uh, in so not too far away from each other, if my memory is correct. <laughs> Yeah, you've got, a, you've got almost a straight road that starts at Ferrari, passes Lamborghini and ends up at, at, at Ducati. And, and they're very, very famous brands, very famous products. Um, and you could argue that Ducati in bikes and Lamborghini in cars typify Italian character and, and Italian brands and Italian products. And that's why they've survived all this time. What I learned... Um, uh, particularly with those two brands, but, but everywhere else I've worked, is that you, 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 can't, you can't rest, you can't sit on this perceived character of a brand, that it still needs interpreting to where it's going. So take Lamborghini as an example. Um, Americans who aspire to own a Lamborghini or buy a Lamborghini or call themselves Lamborghini customers, they are buying a pure essence of that brand that's incredibly Italian and could come from nowhere else. But they still want to interact with that brand in a local way. So I could give you an example. Okay, and a good example would be that perhaps uh, customers in the US have a very high priority set on customer service, you could say. Maybe higher than Europeans do sometimes. Um, American customers could be seen as demanding more from a brand. They're prepared to pay, but they, but they, but they, but they want a certain equilibrium in the balance. So, so they want to be treated like a friend when they go to the dealership. They want, they want if there's ever a problem with the vehicle, for everybody to bend over backwards for them and make it right as soon as possible. And they get upset and negatively surprised if that doesn't happen. Well, in Italy, it might not be quite the same. There might be a little bit more of a we'll deal with it tomorrow attitude. And, and so these are so the brand remains the same, whether you're in Italy or the US, but the interpretation and the servicing of the brand, the culture that the brand lives in might be quite different. And so I go back to Honda saying, you know, act global, you know, think global. Think global means you have to be the same wherever you go. A Honda is a Honda is a Honda, and it represents certain values, whether you're in Guatemala or Berlin. Okay, But 
Guatemala and Berlin, it's operating in two fundamentally different environments. Make sure it fits. Make sure it fits properly. And, and I think that when brands and when executives of brands remember that and are sensitive to that, I think that the interface is great. Um, when they say, well, it works in Italy, so what's wrong with you lot? I think they, I think, I think they have, uh, they have, a, they have a, a short road to walk down. So that, that would be my, you know, my, my guiding principle is uh, understand what you've got understand it three-dimensionally, inside out, be able to speak like it, understand the character of what you're selling, but be sensitive to who you're selling it to. Adapt accordingly. Uh, adapt, adapt accordingly. And, you know, that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't only stand in motorsports. I mean, that stands in any consumer industry. And if you look in the US at the brands, the, the imported brands, that are successful, they tend to come from cultures that recognize that and are not too challenged by it. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the automotive business in the US and, and you can count on the fingers of one hand the number of successful European brands. And they're all from one country. <laughs> it's just narrowed down a lot. <laughs> And, and, and the reason being, not necessarily that their cars are better or better priced, it's because they have assimilated into American society very, very well. And success breeds success and failure breeds failure. So that, that's what I would say. Being a Brit who's been in the US for a, a lot of my adult life, mo actually most of my adult life I've been here and have represented a good number of imports um that that would be my takeaway so then nascar has approached you to consult on some other projects heading into 2022 is there anything you can tell us about this um well uh, all i can say is that w uh, over the last few years i've been involved in a, a project that's a real um, management of change is trying to preserve the heritage and the gloss and the equity of something but try and pivot it and translate it to be relevant now. And I've learned a lot of that. And sometimes it's easier to be a bit of an outsider looking in. Mm. You know, I maintain that I am a guest in this country. I've been a guest for 25 years. Um, and sometimes my perspective is a little bit different as an outsider looking into things that are very American and uh, people are very emotional about. So what, what I'm looking to do going forwards is to try and help manage change wherever possible, um, to preserve equity, but to uh, realize, realize new opportunity. Yeah. 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 So then changing tech slightly, F1's going racing in Miami next year, fingers crossed, as well as Austin. But F1's always kind of had a bit of an issue with really taking off in America, even with the American team of Haas. Do, what do you think it needs to do to get itself to appeal more to the American market? Mm. I know that a million people have been asked this question. <laughs> but, um, but for me, I think there are two variables here. Um, uh, because there's no argument that speed, excitement and glamour sell everywhere, right? So, mm. okay. Uh, and, and F1 has all of that in, in abundance. I think there are two issues surrounding F1 um, uh, traditionally uh, as barriers to success in the US. Um, one is that, and this is a cultural thing, uh, one is that F1 traditionally has, has always um, presented a very exclusive um, image. Like you're, in, you're inside the fence or you're outside with your nose pressed up against it. It's a it, to Americans, it feels somewhat of a class-based motorsport. Mm. Um, uh, and and Americans, um, Americans like to think that if you've worked hard and you've earned money, that you're as um, acceptable as anybody else, regardless of where you've started. And I think F1 has often seemed to be a kind of royalty of, uh, of mm. motorsports and not that egalitarian and, and, and so on. So I think uh, culturally... They've all, Americans have always felt a little distanced from it. Um, 
you know, lo lots of uh, very aristocratic Europeans enjoying, enjoying a glass of something very expensive. Yeah. Uh, you can see through your binoculars, but you can't get a pass to go in there yourself. And I think, so that, that I think is a cultural thing that if you look at American sports that are very successful, they're quite, they're quite open to new competitors and, and, and you don't need to have known someone's grandfather to be able to get in. Um, so, so that's one, but I, think, but I think the major barrier or the major challenge for F1 is the same as it is for any global sport over here because, you know, MotoGP is a complete parallel. MotoGP is on fire worldwide, but has a very small audience in the US. Why might that be? It's, it's simple practicalities. When you have a, a, a global series with, let's say, 22 rounds in it, and 21 of them are on at times of the day or night that no one's going to watch. Yeah. You, don't, you don't create a following for the series. What you do is you create a following for the one weekend when it's in. Yeah. But then people don't buy into the, 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 the characters and the, and the storytelling for the season. And so you need to have, you need to absolutely deliver 120% on that weekend to try and keep even half of the people I, watching it. Well, certainly that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the folks at F1 will have, will have been wrestling with this, with this question for years is, do you sell the US uh, F1 race as a one-off, as a festival weekend, like a golf open or something? Yeah. Or do you try and sell it as the 18th round out of 22? And I think if you sell it as the 18th round out of 22... You got you got some challenges because next week it might be in Indonesia. Ninety five percent of the mm. audience have switched off because they're not going to watch it. They're going to watch it live or not watch it at all, right? Um, yeah. And live if it's at three o'clock in the morning, man, that's the diehards. So I think that it's not about F one. I think it's about global sport in a country that has very powerful national sports which you can follow. Whereas Europeans are a lot more philosophical about this. You know? Not only one race is in your country, but there are lots of races that are close by. And there's some that are two hours different or four hours different. It, it's, it, it's close enough you can get your hands around it. And I think, that, I think that's a challenge for F1. But I will say that the phenomenon of um, Drive to Survive is a game changer. Uh, and I don't know if it is in Europe because uh, I haven't been there for 18 months. Um, but, uh, but, but I can tell you it's a game changer over here. And what F1 does next is critical because I, I, spoke, to a, um, uh, I spoke to a colleague today on a, on a call, on a video call, and we were talking about um, uh, broadcast options for next year and so on. And I mentioned the drive to survive. And he said, Do you know, the funniest thing. He said, I love F1. He said, you know, I love F1. I watch all the races. I said, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he said, it's funny. My wife had no interest in Formula One at all and would roll her eyes every time I ever mentioned it until we watched Drive to Survive together. And now in the run up to every weekend, she asked, oh, how's XYZ um, uh, a, a guy doing? Or how's that team doing? And she has engaged in Formula One via uh, uh, you know, a docu series, and, mm. and has developed an interest in the sport because of it. And I think this turns on its head everything that we were always taught uh, growing up in motorsports is that the, uh, the 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 value is in the racing action. Mm. It's not. It's not. It's, it's so you, you want to see some behind the scenes stuff, and this is kind of especially with something like F one, where like you're saying, you're either in or out of the, the circle. You, you kind of care. you get to get to you get to have to put your head in and have a look you and see what's going on. You need to care. If you care, everything's possible, right? So mm. if you care about that character or that team or good guy, bad guy, or this one's got a really annoying wife or whatever, if you care about that, then the excitement, the danger, the glamour, the technology all fall into place. And I think that we all grew up. You know, my generation in motorsports and in in vehicles was that you hooked people with the technology and the speed, and then they cared about everything else. I think that's changed on its head, and I think that drive to survive is um, is a is a lesson. It's a lesson for us all on 
um, some things are eternal. Human nature is eternal. You know, all sitting around um, a bonfire discussing war stories is actually about engaging people in your world, about building bridges. It's about highs and lows, tragedy and triumph. These are the eternal things. What F1 has got is a backdrop of a, a unique backdrop of being top of the mountain and the highest tech and the, and, the, and the biggest risks and so on. But really what people are buying is, do I care? Uh, do I care about Lewis Hamilton? Who is he? Uh, why, why should I? Yes, he's, he wins every year. He's obviously very good. But why should I care? Who's the guy? What ticks him off? Um, how is he human? Um, and, and I think, and, and what they did so well in, in that series is they didn't just make it about the drivers that you know and I know it takes a whole community uh, oh, yeah. to bring one team to the pit uh, and and once you start talking about the traveling circus it really is a it really is a, a whole world going on in there we have it in America that, that's always the appeal of, of watching the circus you want to know how they do it and then here's these people telling you this is how they do it yeah and, and also there is, there is a delight in seeing the mask slip as well, mm. because everything is so beautifully choreographed and polished and, 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 and PR filtered to the death and so on. But you watch something where there's a camera over the shoulder in real time where something shouldn't have happened. And then what's the fallout from that? I think that's gripping. I think it's gripping. And the sniping between the teams about interpretations of rules or behaviour of, 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 of the drivers, that's fascinating. That's what gets us into their world, as opposed to being outside the fence with your nose pressed on it. I think getting inside the fence is critical. And I know that a lot of people in communications and branding, this is horrific for them um, because they don't get to, they don't get to create that perfect squeaky clean world that they think everybody wants. But actually people don't really want that very much. So you, you want that to an extent, but you don't want it full time. You, 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 want, want, you want to be able to see a bit of balance. You want a balance that feels like you're getting some authenticity. You know you're not going to get 100% authenticity, and you're good with that. But you want some. Uh, and so I think that that, I think that, you know, who, whoever um, originated that idea, whether it was a production company or whether it was some genius in F1, it doesn't matter. They fell on something that a sport that in recent years to... Uh, to non-believers looks a little robotic and a little corporate and so on, that this has proven that it's actually not the case. They're still human beings uh, with the same uh, drives and limitations and peculiarities that everybody else has got. They're just playing in a supercharged world. And I think that that's the, that's the, uh, the key in a country like America to, to, to move the needle for a sport like F1 is that. And, and you know, it's funny, I, I took, a, I took a, a bunch of Americans about three years ago to the Goodwood Festival of the Speed, uh, Festival of Speed. And we were invited, American Flat Track was invited to be one of the classes to go up the hill on the hill climbing. And they, we, were, we were so lucky. They put us in the same group as the F1 cars. Um, so we got a lot of attention, as you can imagine. We were down, we were, we were down at the gridding at the bottom of the hill, alongside, you know, you do a double take um, because, because you know there is a Nelson PK Formula One car right right behind this, um, and and it was fascinating going to Goodwood because at it at its essence, Goodwood is all about these extraordinary one-off cars and bikes and 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 this record and that, but actually it's not. The weekend is driven by the socialising. Um, it's driven by um, seeing stars, like like going to Hollywood for the Oscars um, uh, and eating nice things and having a, a great vantage point and catching some sun and and being in these beautiful grounds. It's it it succeeds because of the human interaction, and that the catalyst for it is all the toys. And and I think there's a parallel between that and F1 is that, you know, the toys are great, but ultimately we want to feel connected in some way. We want to, you want to interact with them. 
yeah and and we've we've tried very hard to uh introduce those principles into into american flat track which was previously quite a rough and tumble sport quite blue collar middle america rough and tumble sport and we've tried to preserve the excitements of that but layer on storytelling and accessibility and and that look over the shoulder um that's what I was thinking when you were saying about the uh, the challenges or disadvantages that F1's got in America at the moment. They're kind of exactly the advantages that AFT does have, though, in terms of the and yeah. they, they seem at very least accessible to everyone. And they're all in America, so you don't have this global problem yes. of, oh, we'll only watch one of them. We can watch all of them and we can take the time to get invested. For sure. Well. For sure. That we know that, that is, uh, those are... Uh, variables that work in our favour, and we we've, we've worked them very hard. Yeah. So, a few fun questions just to finish off. Would you rather go skydiving or deep sea diving? Boy, I'm not sure I'd want to do either. Um, uh, Let's say it's for charity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, deep sea, deep sea, definitely. Deep. What's one form of motorsport you haven't been involved with yet that you'd love to be? Mm -hmm. Um, global rally that that is uh that really is a bonkers sport oh yeah uh, and uh, i i've i've spectated at a couple of uh, uh rallies and the excitement's tremendous uh, so, so you can yeah. get pretty up close there as well so. yeah. I, it's very real very visceral <laughs> yeah i would love to i would love to uh, uh to get my hands on that well, you never know. <laughs> and finally, would you rather play a round of golf with Hugh Jackman or go for a workout with The Rock? Oh, I think I would. Uh, I think I would shoot myself in the temple before ever playing a game of golf. <laughs> workout it is. Hey, Noel, 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 Noel um, Coward uh, wrote a lot of plays. Yeah, and he was very rude about golf. And I remember that as a child, uh, read, uh, reading those plays and, and watching the rudeness about golf. Um, I don't think I've ever played golf in my life. It's, it's, I don't, I mean, personally, I don't think it's a brilliant sport to watch, but I seem to be, I mean, I'm terrible at it, but I seem to be, uh, I seem to enjoy it at least while I'm there. So it's a weird look, one. I, look, I, I'll give you that, um, uh, that uh, golf is a very, could be a very pleasant way of getting some exercise and, uh, and, and strolling around. Um, but not uh, for you. And I wouldn't want to knock anybody who enjoys it. It just wouldn't be for me. Yeah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. I want to thank you again for being here and wish you the best of luck uh, for the rest of the year. And thank you. Much appreciated. It was great chatting with Michael, and I really enjoyed our conversation. I want to thank him again for his time and for coming onto the show, and I wish him the best of luck for his future endeavours. Join me again soon when I'll be chatting to another famous face from the world of motorsport. In the meantime, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe, and check out the other videos on the On The Curbs YouTube channel. Away from YouTube, you can find me over on DriveTribe, and feel free to follow me on Instagram at t.alwas.daily.drivetribe. You can also find me over on GP Grass and TV, where I'm part of their weekly podcast. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again next week for the next episode.